Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. We believe that God's Word has the power to change lives. So grab a pen and paper and get ready for this message. right we could clap we're clappers in New York did you know I was from New York can you tell the accent I bet you thought I went to Harvard or um, but no from New York they tell me I sound like Judge Judy and um, I wish I had her money and I probably could have been Judge Judy like if I wasn't a drug addict and if I was <laughs> if I didn't do all of that kind of stuff but um, God has been so faithful. I want to give honor where honor is due. Pastor Brandon and Pastor Mel, you are outstanding. You are people, the real deal. I mean that. You cannot, I, I travel the world and I've been to a lot of great places and I've been to a lot of not so great places. And I've seen people that use their people to make them look good. But I am telling you, they use their gifts and talent so that they could minister to you, so that you could go out and be all God called you to be. They are absolutely amazing. This church, I prophesy, is absolutely not big enough for what God has in store for you. They will come from the highways and the byways because there's a river that flows from you, from the temple of who you are, into the streets, and everyone will be attracted because it's fresh water. It's water that's not stagnant. And God is going to do things that are going to blow your mind. So get ready. And you're all going on the journey with them. Well, we did a series in our church. And one of the questions which was, I was given was, why do we exist? We hear that all the time. Even secular people, you know, say, you know, why, why do I exist? What am I here for? Well, as believers, this is the only answer. We exist to obey the voice of God. Tell your neighbor, I exist to obey the voice of God. Go ahead. Come on. Tell your other neighbor. You don't have a neighbor, you in the second row. We exist to obey the voice of God. I want you to be lonely. I don't want you to feel lonely. The word obey means to follow the commands or guidance up of. So before we were believers, we know that we had another voice that spoke uh, inside of us and it dictated our life. Whatever that voice said, we did. If that voice said, get up and, you know, go clubbing tonight, we got up and we got one clubbing. If it said, get up and get high or get up and steal. Anybody steal? I used to steal. I mean, I have so much in my testimony, I can't even tell you. I was like a little thief. And, um, and, but anyway, I was driven by that voice. But once the Holy Spirit came inside of me, I was saved washed with the blood of Jesus. And he came and he lives inside of me. And the Holy Spirit is the power of God inside of you and the fire of God inside of you. And that voice is not silent. That voice is always directing us. So God doesn't rent from us on a Sunday. He owns us lock, stock, and barrel. And that's it. So we exist to obey the voice of God. So some of you might be new in the Lord and you might be saying, well, how, how do I hear the voice of God? Well, there's two ways we hear the voice of God. And the first one is through the written word, the logos. And, 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 and the, basically, the word of God is God's voice or his thoughts on paper. It sets our boundaries, but it sets us free at the same time. It's the only book where the author is always present with us. And guys, it's good news, but here's the bad news. You don't always have to agree with it. You just have to obey it because we exist to obey the voice of God. I have a testimony. Um, uh, a number of years ago, I walked around the corner 
to uh, mail a letter. Now, I'm not a walker. I'm a rider. So even I will get in the car to go around the corner just to mail a letter. But this day I was with my granddaughter. At the time, she was probably 8 or 10. So this is going back at least 8 years. And um, so when I get to the, I go down my little block, and then I go down, and on the corner is the mailbox. I see the man that just bought the house on that corner. So he comes out, and I said, oh, hi, I'm your new neighbor. Welcome to the neighborhood. Now, that's not too common in New York. I would have never rang his doorbell, but because I saw him, I welcomed him, and I said, oh, that's my house. And I point now, and, and, and no, it's this way. And, and I said, because our backyards, you know, my backyard where it is, it has a, a, back, a, a side, a, a diagonal, and in the back, right? So we don't have a lot of property. And I said, oh, that's my backyard. And uh, he said, oh, he says, you're the one with the tree. I said, yes, I'm the one with the tree. Do you like my tree? I had like this uh, eight-story pine tree. It was so gorgeous. And when you went in my little uh, backyard, it was like a canopy. You walked underneath it, and it was shade, and it was just the most beautiful thing. And plus, when you looked out of your second floor, you couldn't see any, anybody. It was like total privacy. So I'm enjoying my tree, but I have no idea that my pine needles are upsetting this man's backyard. So he says, oh, you're the one with the tree. And I realized he, he wasn't as happy as I was about the tree. So I said, oh, is, you know, are, uh, is, is my tree bothering you? And he said, well, to tell you the truth, he said, me and the neighbor that's in back of him, which is side of me, that I've known forever. I am in my house 40-something years. They had a conversation about my tree. And, 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 and he said this. He says, well, if you ever want to take the tree down, me and your neighbor, we, we said that we would ship in. And, and I said, well, I said, well, that's my tree, and, 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 and I, it's my responsibility. So we walk away, and my granddaughter says to me, Nana, who does that man think he is? He just moved in the neighborhood. That's your tree. You've been there forever. And I said, well, actually, Marissa, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that as long as it's possible with you, you are to live at peace with all men. And I knew that I had to cut the tree down. So I go home, and I tell my husband. My husband says, you're right. We have to cut the tree down because, you see, we exist to obey the voice of God. We exist to obey his word. And um, so the next day, this was a Friday night. The next day, Saturday, I call a tree company, and, the guy, and I'm, of course, hoping he really can't come because I really don't want, but I want the effort. I want God to know I am making the effort. You know how we do, right? So, so, he, so the tree company says, oh, I happen to be in the neighborhood. I'll be right over. And then he gives me this ridiculous low price to cut the tree down. And I am like, hmm. So he's cutting the tree down. I am in my bathroom window, which faces the second floor. And I am watching them cut this tree down. And I am just devastated. I am just crying. My, my, now my backyard, it is pitiful. It's pitiful. And now I see all the neighbors I never saw before. So, so I, I, the next day was Sunday was church, and I'm like, you know, having the only whining pity party. You know, I did this for you, God. I did this for you, God. I did this. So the next day I go to uh, Dallas, and I'm with Penny, and I'm taking pictures of every tree. And the pastor's wife says, you know, what are you doing? And I explain the whole story, you know, of the martyr I am, I put, took the tree down, and you know, so, you know, I have to get some mileage out of this, I have to get some comfort, and um, so then she, um, so then Thursday comes, it's the end of the conference, and I get a, a, a voicemail from my daughter-in-law, and uh, she says, Mom, you have to call me, it's an emergency. I call her up, she says, you're not going to believe this, there was a tornado in New York, we never get tornadoes. She says, all the trees in the neighborhood have been ripped out at the root, 
and the gardener came and said, had you not taken down the tree, it would have came in and crushed your house. Here I'm thinking I'm doing something for God, and God is doing something for me. Is that not amazing? Anyway, it gets better. It gets better. The next year, I take another walk around the corner to mail the letter, and the guy's out there. And I said, hi, remember me? I'm the one with the tree. And he said, yes, it was so nice of you to take it down. And then I explain a little bit, start to witness to him why I cut the tree down. All of a sudden, his wife comes out, and she's listening, and she goes, now I know who you are. She says, I, I've been, because now she could see our backyard. She says, I've been looking at you and your husband, and I keep saying, I know I know these people. Who are they? She says, I've been visiting your church. Is that amazing? Imagine if I would have said, <laughs> it's my tree. You see, God says, the Bible tells us in John 13, 17, if you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. And the second way we hear from God is through the rhema word, the quickened word, the now word. It's a stirring all of a sudden to do something or not do something. It's our GPS. It's our spiritual ways. Although when that voice comes, every other voice is going to come and say, that's crazy. You shouldn't do that. that. That's out of your league. Or, you know, don't call that person. What are they going to think? And so forth and so on. But you don't realize that by obeying that quickened voice, God is going to use you to change a life. I, I know that I'm sure you've had these experiences. I've had these experiences. I've been on the line shopping and all my clothes, and the Holy Spirit says, put those clothes down because that money is going to be used to pay so-and-so's rent. So you just have to put it down. I was home one day and the Holy Spirit said to me, go in your closet and get all your clothes. It was a, a young girl that had gotten saved. This is years ago. We only wore skirts in church. And um, uh, she had nothing. She came from quite a background. And, and, and the Holy Spirit said, go in your closet and give her all, all your clothes, all your skirts. So I said, okay, God. I went and I, I, I packed them in a shopping bag. I went to church that night. And somebody from church worked in a factory that makes all designer stuff. I gave this girl one bag. The woman gave me three bags full of, of, of clothes. Now, that doesn't always happen, but it is just a miracle how when you obey the Lord. I remember one day I was preaching in a church in Oklahoma, and they had a big um, uh, altar area and with steps, and you could walk down anywhere you want. And I felt as I was getting off the platform, the Holy Spirit said, don't get off here, go over there. I go off, Penny is with me, and all of a sudden, I, the altar call was there, and I start to pray for this young lady. The young lady says afterwards, she says, I, I came and I said, Lord, if you're real, if you're real, let that lady pray for me. But wait, it gets better. Another woman comes over and says to her, does your name start with a J? And she says, yes, my name is Jennifer. She says, I woke up this morning praying for a Jennifer. This girl was going to commit suicide, and God had me get off the platform in a certain way and, and also had this woman come over to her. God is so precise, and we, can st we have to stop discounting ourselves. One morning, just one more quick testimony, my husband was, um, uh, gets up, and he says, Maria, do you have so-and-so's phone number? It was a woman we used to serve the Lord with in, in um, Brooklyn Tabernacle. She had moved away. She married a guy in the Army, and she lived in a different state. And we happened to see her, and she wrote her name, uh, uh, her phone number on a small little piece of paper. And he says, I got to get the number. And I said, you know what, honey? Let's eat breakfast, and then we'll get the number in a little while. And he says, no, no, we have to get the number now. So we go and we find this number, and, and my husband calls her. And she says, Pastor Durso, she says, my husband walked out on me. She says, and I was just putting poison in my drink to feed, my, to give it to my children and to me. I was going to kill myself. You see, tomorrow is Satan's today. If we keep saying, I'm going to do it tomorrow, Satan gets in there, and then before you know it, you don't end up doing something. You are saving people's life, and God wants the quickening power of the Holy Spirit coupled with the obedience of his word because they never 
distract one another. They never disagree with one another. But God wants to use you. Now, when you're reading the Bible, the, I don't know what you do, but I'm going to tell you what I do. I want you to put yourself in every situation. And I want you to feel what these people have felt. I know last night, Pastor Mel, she preached a great word about Paul. And you felt like she was, that, like you were on the ship with him. And you felt what he felt. So you make it very, very human. And when the quickening power of God comes, it's never convenient. It's never convenient. But God will lead you to things that you never wanted to do nor thought you were capable of doing. Let's think how inconvenient it was for Mary to bring Jesus into the world. The Bible tells us in Luke 1, she was a virgin. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. Joseph came from the line of David. He was good stock. He was a good catch. And she's planning her wedding. Suddenly, an angel swoops into her room and tells her she is blessed and highly favored. I want to say this. That's just code word for God's going to turn your life upside down and inside out. That's code word for there's going to be a change of plans. And he tells her, the angel tells her, she's going to conceive and give birth to a son. And it's not going to be with Joey. And you're going to name him Jesus, whether you like the name or not. Because you're just a conduit. You're just a vehicle to, to get God's uh, will in motion. And the Bible tells us in Luke 129, Mary is confused and disturbed. And she's trying to think. She's trying to wrap her mind around, what could this angel mean? Now, you bet your sweet bippy that she was confused and disturbed. Now, I want you to put yourself in her position because none of them knew the outcome, just like none of us know the outcome. We just have to do it, right? Five minutes before the angel swooped in the room, she's in love. She's engaged to be married. She has a Pinterest board in her room. What in the world was going through her mind? Excuse me, angel, uh, what's your name? No, no, no. I'm having a destination wedding. I, I rented the room at the Jerusalem Hilton. The, does that mean I'm not going to get my deposit back? Oh, oh no, 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 no. I, I, I cannot, I cannot carry this. No, no. You see, I have family. They're riding in from Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. No, I cannot get pregnant. I just said yes to the dress. I just had my last fitting, and it's a mermaid, and mermaid dresses definitely will not hide the pouch. <laughs> now, besides, I've been eating matzah, plain matzah, no butter, for a year to fit into that dress. There is just no way. And I've loved Joey since I've been 10. Mary and Joey sitting in a tree. P-I-S-S. I got it. But the Bible says in Luke 138, Behold the handmaid or the servant of the Lord says, Let it be done unto me according to thy word. Notice the thread. Jesus entrances the world in a womb that says, Let it be done unto me according to thy word. And on the cross, he exits the world saying, Not my will, thy will be done. Because that's the staple in every Christian's life. Let it be done unto me according to thy word, according to thy will. Our will has nothing to do with it. Uh, if there was ever a scripture that sums up what we're talking about, it's in John 2. And it, and it says, do whatever he tells you to do. And whatever is the operative word. Now, this is the background of this story. Mary and Jesus, they're invited to a wedding. It's probably a family wedding. And Jesus hadn't started his public ministry yet. And weddings in those days lasted about seven years. They were like, whoop, whoop. They were like partying. And in the middle of the festivities, the family runs out of wine. So Mary gets involved. Don't you hate when people get involved? I mean, you have to... Think about it. Here these servants are thinking they're running out of wine. They could go home early. Not my party, not my problem. But that Mary, you see that Pastor Melanie, she has to come to West Virginia. She's not even from West Virginia. 
Why does she even care about the four? Now, now I have to think, God, do you want me to foster kids? I was happy with my own family. And now all of a sudden, she's got to get involved. So Mary turns around and, and, and says, uh, you know, he, she tells Jesus the problem, and Jesus responds, my time has not yet come, woman. Now, you're a mother, and you do not care how old your son is. And Mary probably gave him that stank look, like, do I have to remind you again what I went through to get you to enter the world? Did I mention again the 85 miles on a donkey in my last trimester? Did I mention the no room at the end? Did I mention the stable? And then she turned, I didn't think so. She turns to them and she says, do whatever he says, he's going to do it. That's right. <laughs> so he tells them to fill up six water, large stone, heavy water pots. And now, each stone water pot held 30 gallons, which is each, which is 180 gallons of water. Now, I don't know about you, but this is how I think. Did you ever once think, where did the water come from? There was no running water. There was no hose. So that means the poor servants who the party could have ended early until Mary got involved. I could have lived my, my comfortable life without you coming along, getting a burden. That means they have to go to the well. This is work. This is exertion. You know, but by the way, it's called the work of the Lord. It's not called the tiptoe through the tulips. It is called the work of the Lord, and it is work, and it's inconvenient work. And we don't know the distance of the well, nor do we know how many servants there were to help. But they needed 180 gallons of water, which is 1,503 pounds of water. That was going to make a lot of wine. So they have five-pound buckets. A five-pound bucket holds 50 pounds of water. So they have to place the bucket in the water, if they had five-pound buckets, at least 30 times. Now, why couldn't the same Jesus who changed water into wine provide the water to fill it up? I don't know, because he wants us to be part of the miracle. Now, what would you do? Would you huff and puff? Would you gather your friends and complain? And say, you know, or go to HR? <laughs> Is that in my job description? See, some of us, we complain instead of just obeying Jesus and being part of the miracle. I mean, why did we have to do the, the conference in Charleston? We're not from Charleston. We're from Mount Hope or um, Beckley. We're from Beckley. Oh, now they want us to pay for the conference. We have to pay for a hotel room. We have to use our gas. I can't go home every day. My husband's going to have to watch the kids. This is what we do. We make a big thing out of things. God is asking us to be part of a miracle. But the Bible says what they did pushed Jesus to the forefront. See, these nameless servants, they're the real vessels. They're the real vessels that God used that are transformed. And they probably never sat down and tasted that wine. They probably never got a thank you. But it's not about the thank you. It's about pushing Jesus to the forefront. In Genesis 12, there's a man named Abram. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah, look to the rock from which you were hewn. Look to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to your father, Abraham, the, who's the father of your faith and, and the mother of your faith, Sarah. So if we want to see why we do the things we do, we just have to look to Abraham. And God wants to start a generation of believers with Abraham to get from point A to point B, a generation of believers that would walk by faith and not by sight. 
So the Bible tells us in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, the Lord had said to Abram. That word had is very, very important because this is a review. This is a recap. This is like your kid goes to the store and buys all the wrong things, and you said, I said, I had said that you were to buy this and not that. So this is what he's saying. The Lord had said to Abram, Genesis 12, this is a rhema word. Go from your country, your people, your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. Now, you know that Abraham lived in a pagan world. world. His family was idol worshipers. He hears God's voice, and he's probably confused like we all were. But he has this rhema experience, and right off the bat, when God calls him, it's a call of separation from the world as he knew it, a call of separation from the familiar and God is changing Abraham's plans. And God says, I will show you. You don't know where you're going, but I'm getting in the driver's seat. And you're not going to ask me to bless what you want anymore. I am going to bless only your obedience. And he says, and this is a type of the Christian walk. We, we leave the known for the, un, for, for the unknown, right? We're planted in a new soil. Now, the call of God always seems negative at first. God, what do you mean I have to serve every Sunday? What do you mean I can't go clubbing anymore? What do you, but you know that we shouldn't look at the negative because with the call of God, it's always multiplication. Don't focus on what God is taking. Focus on what he's going to give you, what he's going to restore. And he says this, this is the promise. I will make you into a great nation. That's compensation for loss of country. Yeah, you left the state you were in, but oh my goodness, I'm going to compensate you beyond. And it's not talking about money. He says, I'm going to bless you. If you think your earthly father blessed you, just wait till you see what your heavenly father will do for you. He says, I'm going to make your name great. You're losing your father's household, but I'm making you the head of a new household, the house of Israel, and my name is going to be attached to your name. I'm going to be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and even when you mess up, I will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. I'm calling you. He says, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. God was saying any cause of yours is a cause of mine. Your fight is my fight. And because we're children of Abraham, Galatians tells us that those promises, that covenant still stands with us. Now let's look at what really happened. Genesis 11. The Bible says Terah, which was Abraham's father, took his son Abram. But God said, Abram, leave your father's household. But Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, the son of Haran. Haran was Abraham's brother, Terah's son, Lot's father, but Haran had passed away. And his daughter-in-law, Sarai, and, and the, the wife of Abram, and together, one big happy family, they set out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. They have good intentions. But when they get to Haran, same name as the father, the brother, the son, they settled there. And Terah lived 215 more years, Terah lived. Now, God told Abram, leave your father's household. He gave him a precise plan. But because it wasn't palatable, because it didn't make sense according to the culture, I'm sure Abram said, I met a God, and he's not an idol. He's a speaking God, and he told me that he has great plans, and he, and he wants me to leave this place and go to a land I know not. And Terah must have said, God's not a home wrecker. Family first. You know, that's the new Christianity. But my Bible says, if you love mother, father, sister, brother more than me, you're not worthy of together they set out good intentions but then they settle and the word settle means to accept a less desirable alternative now just let me say this there are three reasons why possibly we settle in Haran there's a Haran in 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 many of our lives number one Haran was the name of the relative that had passed away. And it represents our past. It represents loss. It represents 
grief. And for some of us, we just can't get past our past. We can't get past our loss. We can't get past our grief. And, and, and we have these unhealthy attachments. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's a sense of failure. Maybe it's a great sense of disappointment but, or shame. And, 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 and those things keep us stuck in Haran. When God says, I'll remove your shame. I'll give you beauty for ashes. God wants us to go forward. See, looking backward will keep you from going forward. Number two, Haran was the halfway mark. If they'll put up a map. It was in between Ur of the Chaldees and, 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 and Canaan. And in between our Ur and our promised land, there's always a Haran. And they get there. It's the halfway mark. They were obeying God. They get tired. They get a little weary. They decide to rest. And all of a sudden, they get sleepy. And now it's 15 years. They can't seem to get up. You see, races are won or lost at the halfway mark. Some of you, you've been serving the Lord a long time. Maybe you didn't start in this church. And you just figured, you know what? I'm going to take a little break for ministry. Or I'm going to retire. Listen, there's no retirement in God. We're going to go to heaven serving the Lord. You may be out of a position, but you're never out of your destiny serving the Lord. Never, ever. And then it's just not so easy to get up and... The third thing is Haran was the last stop before the desert. See, in order for them to leave Haran, they would have had to leave the Euphrates River because Haran was in the same territory as Ur. They, 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 they left their old land, but they don't quite make it to the new land because there's a desert that they're going to have to go go through, and they don't want to go through that desert. The Euphrates is their security. It's their, it's their safety. It's, it's, it's their comfort zone. So we get stuck on the other side, and, and we know after every call, there's a desert. Jesus was called publicly. This is my beloved son, and then he was brought to the desert to be tempted and tried. Oftentimes, we don't want to go through the desert to be tempted and tried. And, and the call is always going to be tempted, tested, always going to be tested. And God wants to bring them through this desert because he wants to, it's a blank canvas, and he knows that in the desert, then the supernatural uh, 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 provision of the Lord is going to be activated because you're no longer relying on your own comfort. It's like when we tithe. We don't give leftovers. We give God our best. And then you'll see God provide the rest. But you're never going to see the miracles unless you get up from that place of comfort, that place of provision. Maybe it's to adopt a foster child or, or whatever. You're never going to see that unless you say, forget my comfort. And they get stuck and it's 15 years. None of the promises of God were activated in Abraham's life for 15 years. And you know why he was able to leave? Because his father passed away. There are some things in our life that have to pass away. There are relationships in our life that have to be let go of. There are, are certain mindsets in our life that have to be put aside in order for us to go forward quickly. Genealogy, Terah gives birth to Haran, and Haran gives birth to Lot. In the Strong's Concordance, it says the, the name Terah means delay, and Haran means dry, place of fruitlessness. And we know that Lot was a carnal man. So is it safe to say that delay always gives birth to fruitlessness, and fruitlessness always gives birth to carnality? But even though Abraham messes up, 
he keeps getting back up. That's the thing. Look to your father, Abraham. He's the author. He's the, he's the father of your faith. He keeps getting up. He keeps messing up. He keeps running back to God because he doesn't have faith in himself. He has faith in God that God is merciful and God is going to, to get on with his life and just accomplish what he wanted to accomplish through him. And at first he couldn't leave his family. But 45 years later, he puts his son on the altar. You see, it's a process. I know for me, at first we get saved and we want to have a, a little wedding and mom and pop Durso get in the driver's seat and they're not saved and our wedding looked like a worldly wedding. It didn't, it didn't represent what God really had done in our life. And we were just sitting there, and, but, but they were paying the bills. My husband worked for them. They were our Euphrates. And then we have our first son, and, and they don't know anything about Christianity, and this is the first grandson, and, and they want to they wanna baptize him in, in the Catholic Church. And, and because they're our Euphrates, we were like, okay. And before you know it, we're at another party because, you know, Italians, everything's a party. To the book of Romans, the kingdom of God is not food and drink. Everything's food and drink to the Italians. And they're having this huge party, and they're dancing, and we grieved because we know we didn't take a stand, but then God gave me a, a second son and a third son, and, and we took a stand. And before you know it, we're saved for maybe 15 years, and, and the Holy Spirit comes and says, I want you to go and pastor this church that was handed to the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Well, actually, they came to us, and we knew that we knew it was God, and I didn't want to leave the family business. I didn't. We were making $1,000 a week in 1985, take-home pay. There was a lot of money. We got cars, and they had vacation homes, and they would send us on vacations. They would give us ten dollars to $15,000 a year, cash bonuses. But then we couldn't fight. We couldn't fight the call any longer. We, we had to get away from that comfort zone. And we went from making $1,000 a week to $80 a week. $80 a week. The church paid our mortgage $287 a month. And they paid our light bill. We had $80 a week with three little boys. I remember one day I, went to, I, I was going to make my kids peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch for the next day. And I realized I don't have bread and I don't have money to buy a loaf of bread. I grew up with money. My husband grew up with money. We didn't know what it was not to have. But the Holy Spirit said, just go to the prayer meeting. When I got to the prayer meeting, there was a woman in the lobby. She still comes to our church with a big loaf of Wonder Bread. She says, does anybody need a loaf of bread? I was like, yes, that's my bread. You see, I met Jehovah Jireh. It was a time when I said, God, if I eat another egg, I'm going to cackle. I'm going to grow feathers. I wish I had a steak. And out of nowhere, somebody brings our bell and says, would you like a steak? We defrosted these steaks, but we decided to go out. And I was like, thank you. I closed that door, honey. I had a glory fit. <laughs> you see, I met Jehovah Jireh. I didn't know him at the, that side of the Euphrates. I, I didn't know him. I didn't know him. And we have three sons now that are pastors. But I just want to say to you, every act of obedience is generational. See, had Abraham not obeyed, we wouldn't be here. Had Jesus not obeyed, we wouldn't be here. This is a generational obedience. So we have to get out of the thing that we live for us, and it's about us, and how is God going to bless us? We take the word us out of it. We exist to obey the voice of the Lord. And some of you here, you're settled in, Har in a Haran. We've all been there. We, maybe you're stuck in, in grief. Maybe you're stuck in the past. Or maybe you're tired and you decided to rest and you, you've just settled. Or maybe you're just afraid to leave your Euphrates. But God is saying this purpose in your life that's so much greater than you are. And he wants you to get up and leave that place and obey his voice.
because he bought you with a price. He owns you. It may not be as drastic as the things that I've done. It just might be. Maybe you're an introvert and God is saying, invite someone over for dinner. That's a miracle. You don't know how you're going to change that person's life. So if you're here today and you say, God, I don't want to settle. I don't want to settle. I want you just to raise your hand. And you're here, you're saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I know there's so many. Thank you. I want you to stand unashamedly, unashamedly stand. And let's just say it out loud. Let's speak to that giant of Haran. I am not going to settle. Let's just say it. I'm not going to settle. I don't want to settle, Lord. You have so much more for me. God, we want to push Jesus forward. So today, God, everyone's standing, Lord. I'm standing with them because there's always a place where you're calling us. The new thing becomes the old thing, oh God. And we want to go to the next new thing. We want to push you forward so that your name will be glorified in all the earth. Let us be people that releases generations, God, because there's generations tied up in every act of obedience in our life. Do something mighty, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Again, thanks so much for tuning in today. We hope that you've enjoyed this message and that you felt the presence of God right where you are. If you did enjoy it, we'd love to see you live at one of our campuses. Mount Hope meets at 9, 11, and 5, and Summersville meets at 11. We'll see you there.